a lot has happened in the world of Palantir this week. So I wanted to create this video to make sure you are fully up to date with everything that's going on. Please feel free to use the timestamps for this video because I'm gonna bring you about 10 pieces of news and information that you must know as a Palantir investor. And if you know any of them, like I said, use the timestamps and feel free to jump around. So let's just get right into this. On the 8th of December, Palantir and Fujitsu announced a new partnership. This is not the first time that they have worked together. Back in 2020, they announced that they were going to start a partnership together, a strategic partnership. But we've now just learned that they are expanding and extending the scope of this to continue working together. So what is it that they're actually doing? Well, let's just have a look here. Fujitsu and Palantir to strengthen strategic partnership to solve societal challenges and accelerate business transformation globally. Fujitsu Limited and Palantir Technologies Japan today announced on the 8th that they have signed an agreement to develop a strategic global ship global partnership with the support of Palantir Technologies, focusing on the solution of societal issues and the acceleration of business transformation. Under this partnership, Fujitsu will incorporate Palantir's AI and data integration capabilities as a key element in the data infrastructure for Fujitsu's own platform or solution called Uvance which is a portfolio of global solutions that address business challenges and solve societal issues. They will begin providing services in the Japanese market in 2023, so now basically, and then expand to new markets including North America, Europe and Asia Pacific next year. And like I just said, they initially entered a strategic collaboration to strengthen the digital transformation sector in the Japanese market back in 2020. Since then, Fujitsu has been Palantir Japan's exclusive flagship technology partner in Japan, helping customers achieve digital transformation in manufacturing, utility, financial services, and public sectors. So just in that sentence alone goes to show you how relevant Palantir solutions and software really is for a variety of different sectors. We've just had manufacturing, utility, financial services, and pu public sectors named right there. So as far as I understand, Fujitsu is basically like a consultancy company that are utilizing Palantir's software and solutions to then help them solve their customers' business needs, if that makes sense. Time and time again, we say that the total addressable market and how many different sectors Palantir can actually work with is ginormous. And obviously you can argue that a company is better if they are more niche and they've got a really targeted market. But as an investor, as long as Palantir's solutions are really, really valuable, you know, they can take the whole market here, in my opinion. So let's just continue with what else is being said. As a strategic alliance partner, Fujitsu will expand the scope of this collaboration beyond the Japanese market to North America, Europe and Asia Pacific. The partnership will leverage Fujitsu's know-how developed through in-house implementation and case studies for customers in Japan and Fujitsu and Palantir's extensive customer base in the global market. So they will develop services that incorporates the capabilities of Pal uh, Palantir's Foundry, which integrates and manages large-scale data distributed across Palantir's various systems into the data infrastructure for um, Uvance, and then Palantir AIP, which securely activates LLMs and other AI on customers' private networks, will also be integrated and provided to customers. This will empower customers to connect and leverage processes and data that are fragmented across organizations and enterprise. We have heard time and time again how Palantir is so useful in leveraging processes, in connecting fragmented and disjointed data across organizations and bringing that all into one place and then using that to allow customers to make the best use of their data. We've heard that use case in literally every partnership that Palantir has, which goes to show you, and this will come up later on in the video, that it doesn't matter what sector you are in or a business is in. Palantir still have solutions that are applicable. Doesn't matter the sector, and that's really powerful. So now let me tell you why this partnership is important. And there are four main reasons. So let's just quickly go through them. Number one, the contract, as far as I understand, is worth $40 million. Obviously, any money going to Palantir is good for us investors. Secondly, it's demonstrating global expansions. They are growing outside of the US. And for a long time, they have been very US focused and seeing great growth there. 
but they're also growing outside of the US on the commercial sector now. That's really good. We want them ultimately to be as global as they can be, diversifying those revenue streams. And we've seen it with the NHS contract recently, obviously here in the UK, and more and more partnerships are coming up that you know we are seeing that global expansion. Third, this is yet another example of Palantir seeing an expansion in an existing contract, a renewal of a contract. This keeps happening time and time again. Businesses that Palantir are working with, whether on the commercial side or the government side, are finding their solutions so valuable that they then want to find new ways to work with Palantir moving forward and they're not ready to actually, you know, leave Palantir. This is showing us, as people that don't actually use Palantir software every day, that it is providing that value. And it's showing how much of a sticky business Palantir really is. And the last one is that we've just learned that for a while, Fujitsu were using Palantir's Foundry, but they are now looking to start incorporating AIP. And we're seeing this a lot. It's kind of going one of two ways. Either customers that are currently on board with Palantir's um, core offerings like Foundry are looking to actually start using AIP. We're seeing the demand go crazy for AIP. So they're upselling it that way. Or we're seeing the opposite thing happen, whereby customers are seeing this shiny new product called AIP. They want it, they want to get involved in that. And then alongside that, Palantir are smartly upselling Foundry. So they're kind of hitting, you know, hitting it both ways there, upselling in both directions. The next one really is a new partnership, and that is this one right here. So HISA stands for Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority. And they have actually partnered with Palantir. You can see here to develop an AI tool to help identify horses at risk of injury, increased injury, to debut in early 2024. So let's just quickly see what they're actually doing. They Palant they've partnered with Palantir, blah, 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 to create a data enabled tool to assist industry stakeholders in identifying horses at risk for injury before they race. The tool will generate a daily report for each racetrack flag in any horses entered in that day's races who may present poten potential risk factors for injury. This enables identification of those at-risk horses with increased efficiency and accuracy and will inform hands-on pre-race inspections of each runner. Okay, so you might be wondering why this is important. Well, again, there's a few reasons. Number one, no one predicted this partnership. And what does that mean? Well, that means, again, that Palantir are able to work with any sector, even if we didn't see it coming. I definitely wouldn't have ever guessed this partnership. No way. But it goes to show you, like we keep saying, that Palantir's solutions are valuable to anyone. It's also showing us that artificial intelligence and data efficiencies are being looked at by loads of different sectors, not just the tech sector, not just the financial sector, not just healthcare, but like we've just learned, Pretty much any sector is looking to integrate AI into their organization, their business, to enhance data efficiencies, to enhance decisions, business critical decisions. And in this case, in terms of seeing which horses are actually at risk and preventing that injury. In this case, actually seeing which horses may be at risk and working to prevent potential injuries. This is one of the real areas that Palantir is providing value. They are enabling organizations and businesses to be proactive rather than reactive. That saves businesses money, time, and stress. And every company, even every person in the world right now is producing vast volumes of data every single day. And Palantir is one of those companies that can actually enable those businesses to manage and optimize that data through their platforms and through their workflows using AI. So if the Horse Racing Integrity and Safety Authority is using AI and turn into Palantir, then ultimately, I guess the entire world, all the sectors soon will be using Palantir, well, using AI and then maybe Palantir. This means there is still so much market for them to capture. And then we had a post on X from Palantir themselves. And this post says, Retrieval Augmented Generation, RAG, enables generative AI to retrieve data from outside sources. Palantir's Ontology Augmented Generation, OAG, takes RAG to the next level, enabling LLMs to leverage not only data, but the logic and actions that drive decision making. So just to give you an overview, in case you have no idea what that means, retrieval augmented um, generation, RAG, 
is a technique used in AI to enhance the abilities of AI. So to enhance the abilities of large language models to generate responses to the users, not just based on what it's learned in its training, but also by retrieving additional information from external data sources in real time. Why is that useful? Well, it allows the AI to give detailed, current, up-to-date, accurate responses to provide answers that weren't maybe contained in its training data. And then we learned that they're taking it one step further through OAG. Now, this is more of an advanced AI technique that builds upon the idea of RAG. So whilst RAG focuses on retrieving relevant information, OAG takes that then a step further by actually incorporating an understanding of relationships and logic inherent to specific domains or ontologies. This advanced technique is really beneficial and useful in those complex specialized fields where that decision making actually relies on understanding those intricate relationships and processes. So this shows how competitive and innovative Palantir are really being, yet they are still being somewhat ignored by a lot of people. You can see here that Palantir were completely missed off of this table. They weren't added as a data infrastructure company nor an AI application company, even though a lot of companies here may be considered Palantir competitors. So I think this indicates that it is still very early dates for this company. We also had the global head of commercial at Palantir put on X this here that says, very pleased to see others attempting to copycat the bootcamp go-to-market approach. Shop us last, you'll love us. Now, this seems to indicate that some other company or companies are also now copying the go-to-market strategy of the AIP boot camps that Palantir have. Now, Omni did a little bit of digging um, on this and shared here that it seems to be Snowflake that are actually now doing boot camps like Palantir are. Now, I think it's important to say that Palantir are not the ones to come up with boot camps or this idea of having a session where people can learn a particular technology or skill in a short space of time, like hands-on keyboard experience. They're not the first. They've not come up with this idea. However, what this does show is that other potential competitors of Palantir and other companies within that sector are actually looking at Palantir and saying, hang on a minute, these AIP boot camps are really working. They're really helping them scale this product. We should try this ourselves. If they weren't seeing the value that these are actually having, they probably wouldn't bother also trying them. The next piece of information that I want to bring you up to date on is Project Titan. This is a massive, massive project. There's been many stages to it and it's been going on for quite a long time. But essentially the US Army want to modernize the way that they operate on the battlefield. They want to integrate and analyze data from various sources, various sensors, and to enhance situational awareness and make better decisions in real time. That's what Project Titan is trying to do. Now, like I said, there's been different stages to this and the most recent stage is that um, two companies, Palantir being one of them, Raytheon being the other, which is now called like RTX or something, were both given $36 million each to come up with a prototype. That prototype is then being tested by the, pe the soldiers on the ground and the people in charge to then decide who actually gets this contract. It could be that this contract goes to Palantir and Raytheon. We don't know. We're going to have to wait and see. But anyway, we were expecting this contract to be announced in Q4 2023, so any day now. However, we have had the news that this has been slightly delayed and pushed back. So we can see here, let's just have a quick look. Project Titan, the program dubbed Titan, has been moving through a 14-month rapid prototyping phase during which RTX, like I was just saying, and Palantir demonstrated competing systems. They are now basically doing acceptance testing and soldier touch points, actually seeing which one they want to go with. So the program's executive officer for intelligence, electronic warfare and sensors told reporters on December the 5th that those summer demonstrations will inform which of the prototypes the army chooses to field. The decision he added is expected between January and March. We kind of expected to hear by the end of this year that is not happening. It's going to be happening now between January and March. Don't know when between those two, two, uh, those two months, sometime soon anyway. It is not surprising with a government contract like this that there is delays. We saw that with the NHS delays time and time again, but it's coming. I'm feeling pretty confident that Palantir will get this contract, but I don't know. 
We don't know. We are going to have to wait and see. I've explained before that this contract is really important and quite a big deal for Palantir. But it seems like some investors, some people are getting quite bored with Palantir because there is no big shiny catalyst coming up in the next month or so. You know, we've had the NHS, we've had the gap profitability, the S&P 500 inclusion, eligibility criteria. We've had all these catalysts aligned. We were expecting Project Titan by the end of the year. That has now been pushed back. So I think some retail investors maybe aren't seeing the long-term investing strategy of Palantir and are instead maybe getting a bit bored and selling out. Who knows, but that could definitely be happening. Let me know in the comments how long you are planning to hold Palantir stock for. And then we've got some quite juicy commentary and information. Now, just to bring you up to date on this before I share the latest, let's just retrack a little bit. I think I have spoken about this on the channel or in the live very recently, but there is this analyst, a William Blair analyst named Louis De Palma. He has typically been very, very bearish on Palantir and he's given sell ratings and low price targets a few times in the past. A little while ago, I say a little while ago, a few days ago, he maintained the bearish stance that he has for Palantir, giving it a sell rating um, on November the 21st. He gave his sell rating due to a combination of factors concerning Palantir's current contractual relationships and potential future conflicts over data ownership with major clients. What's he on about? Let's read on. Uh, he observed that recent statements from the US Army, which is a significant client for Palantir, indicate a desire to move away from proprietary data sources, uh, solutions. The Army's intent to switch towards open source vendors suggests a decrease in reliance on Palantir's services, which could impact the company's revenue, especially given the upcoming contract renewal. This uncertainty around the contract's value and future Army-related revenue streams is a key factor in the sell rating. He interprets the Army's plans as an indication of potential friction regarding the ownership of data that may arise with Palantir's commercial licensing model. The Army starts on maintaining ownership of its data as opposed to allowing it to become proprietary through vendor solutions points to a misalignment with Palantir's business practices. And this could lead to a reduction in the scope of Palantir's engagement with the Army and potentially other clients may follow suit. This was really concerning. So he's basically saying that he's either heard at a conference, whatever, the US Army directly, or he's got a source that went to a conference and heard that they are saying these things. They want to move away from Palantir software and go to more open source vendors. There's a misalignment on data ownership. Very concerning considering these are the sort of things that we heard when we had the whole NHS contract happening. This whole narrative again that Palantir owns data and things like that. So this did cause some retail investors to sell out of their positions. It was concerning. They were then thinking that, you know, Palantir's not getting this contract. It doesn't sound good. The US Army's massive on the government side of Palantir, loads and loads of revenue from them. What's going on? However, look what's now just come out. Lisa Gordon, who is head of global communications again at Palantir, so works within Palantir, told Barron's that there is no data ownership conflict between Palantir and the US Army or any other entity. She also made it clear that Palantir does not own, uh, have any ownership rights to any customer data. There is no data ownership conflict between Palantir, the Army or Army Vantage or elsewhere. Palantir does not have, retain any ownership rights to customer data on the government side or the commercial side. I don't know how many times Palantir themselves or anyone else in the community are going to have to say this. I just, I don't know. They don't own the data. They don't have the access to just sell the data or anything like that, but it's still happening. These concerns are still being voiced. And then the CTO of Palantir got involved in this conversation too. And he said the US Army, so the US Army themselves have had to come out and correct what this analyst has actually said about Palantir because ultimately it was misinformation. It was inaccurate, literally fundamentally incorrect, which is kind of concerning considering, you know, these are the people researching the companies and giving advice on what to do with in investments, which could ultimately change someone's lives and they're getting the basics wrong. Anyway, let's see. So they've corrected the record that the analyst got wrong, offered additional context regarding his uh, remarks on data ownership. So someone from the US Army said, to clarify my remarks last week, so they did have a conversation, that bit's true. Our concern about data ownership and rights is directed at the entire defense technology community regarding the Army's expectations of industry 
and will inform future data requirements across several platforms. To be clear, we're satisfied with the Army Vantage program, its IP contract language, its open data environment to facilitate Army collaboration and its connection with third party tools. There it is right there, the US Army saying themselves, we have no problem. We, we're not worried about Palantir having certain ownership of data. We're not worried about not having it you know, open source. We, we are happy with the connection with third party tools and the open data environment. We're happy with the Army Vantage program. I'm really glad that, you know, the CTO of Palantir, another member of Palantir and the Palantir community and the US Army themselves have all come out and corrected this misinformation. From a recent CNBC interview that Alex Karp did alongside a member of Fujitsu about that new partnership that I've just mentioned, there were some other remarks in there that were particularly bullish that I wanna share. Uh, we just can't keep up with our product dem uh, demand. Uh, we looked for and found ideal partners for our services. Uh, we are just breaking at the seams in the U.S. Um, and they are going to help us grow even more rapidly for providing their very, very competent services to the U.S. market while we are able to scale our product. And that just, it's a very big issue for us. Demand for AIP has been unprecedented. Um, uh, we built uh, aspects of for enterprise AI that are unique. The market's beginning beginning to recognize it, uh, and we need help. And they're helping us, and they're very competent. We like working with them. So, in that clip, you have just heard him say three very very bullish statements. Number one, we just can't keep up with our product demand. Number two, we are breaking at the seams in the U.S. And number three, demand for AIP has been un unprecedented. So based on that, they are seeing the growth in the US market, probably both on the commercial side and the government side. And now we know that they're expanding globally with the NHS contract, with this other contract that we've just learned. We can see how this is all aligning to a global company. They're already a global company, but you know what I mean? More global in the future. He's saying they are struggling to keep up with demand. Like obviously that could be a red flag. We need them to keep up with demand. But the point is they are, they've got the demand. That's, that's the crucial thing. And the demand for AIP in particular, unprecedented. And we've heard about this time and time before. We've heard how many um, AIP boot camps they are now doing. We know all this. We are now just waiting to actually get the numbers and then to see the monetization. As Palantir stock has been dipping over the last five days or so, lots of retail investors have been buying the dip, but not just retail investors. We've also learned recently that Kathy Wood over at ARK Invest has added over 1.5 million shares of Palantir across three different ARK funds. So they are now seeing an opportunity to add to their current position, actually build out their exposure to Palantir. So they obviously feel pretty bullish about the next however months in terms of stock price and where this company is actually going. However, we've also recently seen lots of insider selling and a large institution selling Palantir. I made a whole video on that and I'll link it up here. There's an ex-employee that had an interview recently and he actually spoke about what he liked when working for Palantir. So let me just show you this clip quickly. Resonate and continue to resonate. One is I guess I should just caveat to start, like unbelievably grateful for the opportunity and experience work at Palantir. I think it's an incredibly formative experience for me in my life. I think a couple of the lasting impressions. One is take on hard problems, just like seeing firsthand how we can actually have a huge dent in really big ambitious problems that are, I think for a lot of people's imaginations, just kind of like unsolvable. I think giving us that sort of space to work on those things was one big one. I think another big one was just like really heavy, heavy, heavy focus on the quality of the people. Um, just seeing firsthand the amount of energy, tradecraft, care that goes into the hiring decisions that were made at Palantir, and then the quality of the people that they were able to bring in, and then how to deploy those people against the problems. I think that was like number two. And then I think three was really just like really heavy focus on going to first principles, thinking about what is the actual problem we're trying to solve, and then getting really tactical. So we just heard his three highlights from working at Palantir. Number one, Palantir are willing to take on hard problems. They will take on those really large ambitious problems that may seem unsolvable for other companies. And they will use first principle thinking to actually solve those problems. That to me sounds an awful lot like Elon Musk and Tesla, first principle thinking, taking on those problems that seem unsolvable, actually changing and revolutionizing 
different industries. And then he said that there is a heavy focus at Palantir on the quality of the people. They make good hiring decisions. So why is any of this important? Well, it's because the employees at the company are ultimately the ones actually doing the work every day and the ones that are moving the company forward. If those employees are not happy and they are not happy to be working at that company, they don't like the direction, they don't like the hiring process, they don't like the problems that the company are taking on, they are not going to be performing their best. However, it seems like quite the opposite. People are very happy at Palantir and we, we know that actually the best talent is flocking to Palantir. And then lastly, we've got this update from Palantir. So they have been very bold in showing support for Israel. And they've gone a step further now with their actions. And they've said, we are launching an initiative for students who, because of anti-Semitism, fear for their safety on campus and need to seek refuge outside of traditional establishments of higher education. They are welcome to join Palantir and we are setting aside 180 positions for them immediately. More details to follow shortly. Next week, I will be posting videos on my brand new channel. The channel is Stock Speak. This channel will focus on giving an overview to many different stocks. And the whole idea is that someone can watch the video, someone can follow the channel and learn about many, many different companies, an overview level, and then they can decide if they want to do further research. So please comment and let me know what companies you want me to cover on that new channel. And of course, make sure to subscribe to it ready for the first video being released. Thank you so much for watching this video and I'll be back very shortly with another.